Yes, dear, we're making more progress now. Yes, dear, we're making more progress now. Yes, dear, we're making more progress now. We still have a long way to go. They promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Promise to bring us more revenue and quality. Winston is now on its way. Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran. As I told you over the last few weeks, today would be my Highland Lake special. It's actually about the town and the lake, so you'll be seeing a, a picture of the town hall superimposed over Highland Lake uh, from time to time tonight as we go through the program. There's a couple things I'd like to point out before I go through the agenda. One is, be sure to vote on Saturday between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. at the Pearson School on the uh, proposed 5.41 percent budget increase. I do see some signs up that I think have the wrong number on them, but uh, anyway, that's pretty much what it is. And um, I'll try to get out there and vote uh, whichever way um, you, you are inclined. And the important thing is to vote. Bring all the members of your family with you that can vote and try to make it a, a good turnout for this, uh, for this uh, budget. Now, tonight, I'd like to, since I'm going to be talking about Highland Lake, I'd like to dedicate this program to Lydia and her mother and father. Uh, they enjoy the lake. They live in the Highland Lake District, I'm pretty sure. Uh, they're right on the outskirts of it, if not. And they do enjoy the lake. They ride their bicycle around. And, uh, and um, one of the reasons I'm having this program tonight is because we do want to preserve the lake so that when uh, people like Lydia grow up, they can use the lake just like uh, the, like we do, and uh, that we can keep it uh, uh, in good shape. So this is to you, Lydia, your mom and dad, and uh, um, I hope you continue to enjoy this lake for many years to come. Now for the agenda, the uh, uh, first thing I'm going to just talk a bit about is the purpose of this program. I'm going to have a short disclaimer. Um, you always have to have a disclaimer here. <laughs> uh, background. Uh, a little bit about my background, not much. Uh, assumptions uh, for tonight. And then I'm going to go into the town problem, which I've written papers about and distributed them all over town. Uh, the lake problem, uh, which uh, most of the information I garnered through attending public uh, hearings on the uh, development projects and the you know, wetland commissions and, and uh, be participating in other on one commission that was trying to do some uh, dock and mooring work. And uh, so most of it's all factual information uh, from town records. And then I'm going to come up with a, what I think is a practical solution 
to this uh, dilemma that I'm going to produce, present to you this evening. None of this is new information to anybody who has been watching the program over the last year. But if you're from New York, New Jersey, or some other, you know, Fairfield County or somewhere, and you're not here in the winter, you may not be familiar with this information. So the purpose tonight is, the uh, purpose of this program is to emphasize the fact that the town of Winchester and the Highland Lake District, it's called HLD. The Highland Lake District, now if we just picture up for a second, the Highland Lake District is more than just the people who live on the lake, the three bays of the lake. It also extends up into the hills here and out into side streets. So it's a whole area called the Highland Lake District. And uh, that's what that's known to, to the town. I don't know the exact boundaries. It would probably take me uh, six months to figure it all out. And it's not worth it for this particular exercise. So that's the Highland Lake District that we're going to be talking about tonight. It includes the lake. and includes roads around the lake and uh, hills around the lake and, uh, and, uh, and that kind of thing. All right? So that's what we're going to be uh, partly talking about tonight. The Highland Lake District share a symbiotic past and future, both past and future. This lake has been around for a long, long time. This town has owned the lake. Uh, I guess the state owns part of it, but the town, uh, it's a town's lake, basically. And uh, it doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to the town, and some of the water parts, the water parts of it belong to the state, and there's a little confusion and all that. But basically, uh, that's what it has. Long before any of the existing residents were there, hundred years ago, the lake was there, and it was used by the town for, to run the factories and for other reasons, and it was used by the farmers all over the lake, too, uh, for, for there. there's still some undercrossings around under the roads for cows to get down to the lake the way they did in the old days. I don't think they do that anymore, but uh, that's what used to happen uh, uh, when they went down that way. So. Uh, but these two, uh, two entities, one of which is part of the town, the Lake District, they have a symbiotic relationship. Both have many problems and many opportunities and are financially reliant upon each other. And that's what I want to go through tonight. I want to go through a bit of that, how they are financially reliant upon each other and why they need each other for financial success. The disclaimer. Uh, the numbers and information utilized in this program have been gleaned from various town documents and town meetings over the last three or four years. I've, I've looked at information that's older than three or four years, but I've been around here crawling around the town for about three or four years now uh, in my spare time um, trying to get information, attending meetings, attending public hearings, reading documents, talking to people in the town hall. I always tell people, everybody says, why are you always down in the town hall? They think I'm trying to undermine them or something, but I'm not down there to undermine them, but I'm down there to find out information. How does the town work? What is the relationship between the lake and the town? That kind of thing. The information is pretty accurate, but any mistakes are mine and mine alone. If you spot an inaccuracy that is valid, let me know and I will correct on the next program. Now, when I say valid, I mean you check out the facts first and make sure that you're happy that you've got a fact and then bring it to me and then I'll double check it again with the town people and then if I'm wrong, I'll say so and I'll change my approach because uh, that's very important. The intention here is to help create an environment for success. I've talked on this program a long time about it creating an environment for success. The name of the program is Planning for Success, so we need to create an environment for success. We don't have an environment for success right now, according to many, many, many meetings and people I, I've uh, gone to. Other people say the same thing. I'm not the only one who says this kind of thing. So we have to, we have, my intention is to help create an environment for success uh, where the information that we're using here is changing from month to month, but the essence of what I'm going to say remains the same. For example, one of the developments I'm going to talk about later started out with like 700, uh, 370 units. Now it's down to 225 units. Uh, went from like to, uh, 370 to 270. Now it's down to 225. So things are changing through the land use boards and uh, the numbers are changing and all. But in the essence of it all is still the same. Uh, and uh, will present an excellent opportunity to our town. 
my background, I'm not going to go into it much tonight. There's plenty of papers floating around town with my background on it. Everybody asks me for my background. Whenever you do anything around here, they say, let's see your resume. So I put out my resume, and I, and I written in papers what my background is. But basically, I am a retired corporate executive and a local resident and have considerable experience as a corporate executive and system analyst. I was also a, pre a president and CEO for seven years of an environmental system measurement company in San Diego, California. It was a private company, and I had a couple partners in that business. So I do know quite a bit about, uh, I'm not an expert like some of the experts we bring in to talk about uh, plants and things in the water, but. Uh, but I do know a lot about it, and I do a lot of, know a lot about the measuring equipment and how these things are approached, probably more than most people around here. Uh, we have owned our property in Winston since 1974. Assumptions. There are many positive points to be emphasized about the town of Winston and its Highland Lake. I could sit here for a week and talk about all the positive points about Highland Lake and all the positive points about Winstead. But on this program, I don't have time for that. What I want to do is focus on the areas that we need to improve to make it a better town and to make it so that when Lydia gets to be in her 20s and 30s, she can enjoy this lake as much as your children do, or my children do, and my grandchildren do, and my wife and I did when we were young. So that's the purpose of this program. Tonight's program of planning for success, which is this program, will deal only with the existing problems with both the lake and the town and offer a suggested uh, suggestion to improve the situation. Town employees at all levels, in my opinion, provide an excellent service with the money they have available. It's like your own personal family. You do the best you can for your children and your grandchildren, yourself and your mom and dad and your uncles and aunts and anybody else with the resources that you have available. And some of those resources may be just your personality and your generosity. Uh, the Highland Lake volunteers try to do their best with their experience and the money that they have at their disposal. So I'm really not trying to start throw any stones here at either the town or the lake or its volunteers or the employees. I think everybody is trying their best and is doing their best within the resources that they have available. There are various philosophies and viewpoints in the town and no one group represents them all on any given issue. So there's no one group we can turn to. You're going to see we have a, a wide variety of problems. There's no one group that has all the answers. What we, what we need, like the EDC is trying to do now, is pull all this stuff together and have a team effort towards solving and resolving our problems. And uh, that's also what the selectmen are trying to do. There are various philosophies and viewpoints at the lake. And no one group represents all the people at the lake on any issue. A few years ago, I went out and I did a petition around the lake and talked to a lot of lake homeowners about an issue with dock and mooring, and I found out that everybody, not everybody agrees with any particular group on the lake. They all have their own opinions. On some things they agree, and on other things they don't agree. So there's about uh, 580, I think, houses around the lake more in the Highland Lake District, but are just around the lake on the water, there's a good 500 or so or more, I don't know the exact number, but they all have their own views on everything. So uh, nobody can stand up at any meeting and say, I represent 400 uh, groups on the lake or anything like that. Or that, that. Just because people are members of organizations doesn't mean everybody in the organization agrees with them. I found that out uh, the hard way when I did my petition, and I was much to my surprise and much to my my happiness as well. I was happy to see that people had a mind of their own and they wanted to understand the problems and the facts and then they wanted to sign the petition or not sign the petition, whatever it may be. Uh, facts. I want to talk a bit about facts because I try to deal always with the facts. Not always successful because it's very difficult to obtain facts. It takes a lot of time to work with facts. But I try to seek out the facts and try to deal with facts and whenever possible, because I'm a systems analyst, I mean, do many things, but one of them, when I started, I was a mathematician and systems analyst in the computer industry, and then I grew up uh, through that. But uh, whenever possible, if an important error is pointed out to me, 
in my facts, I will fix it. First, I'll check it out and make sure it's accurate, and then I'll fix it. Now, um, preparing for a program like this, where you deal with facts instead of just supposition and accusation, uh, preparing for a program like this is time consuming. It takes most of my week. And it isn't easy. It's very difficult. You have to deal with a lot of personalities. You have to interfere with people when they're trying to do a day's work and uh, try to be as unobtrusive as possible when getting these facts. You have to read a lot of things. You have to dig into the documents in the town hall. So obtaining facts is often like peeling the layers of an onion. And I do have an onion here. Matter of fact, I got two onions here. And uh, the reason I brought this onion, I use this around the world when I gave courses a lot, because you need to uh, often question people as a systems analyst and question them many, many times. And that's like peeling the layers of an onion. For example, if you say, somebody from a lake once told me, cement is bad for the lake. So I went out and I checked with environments around the country and the uh, various uh, cement organizations, and they all say cement is not bad for the lake. Cement is inert. So you go back to the person who said cement is back for the, bad for the lake, and they say, oh, well, it takes up space. So then you have to go, and, you have, and, the, and the lake is owned by the state, so you shouldn't be using the space. So you go to the state, you ask a lot of questions, and you find out, well, they don't really have anything against it. Some, some people in the state would say, yes, that's OK. Other people would say, no, we, we prefer not to see it happen for many, many, many reasons. And then so you go back, and they say, oh, yeah, but then, if, then you're taking up, uh, uh, if you dig a footing for that, uh, you are, uh, you are uh, uh, endangering the uh, uh, microorganisms in the lake. And then you go to people and they say, well, if you do it when it, the lake is frozen, it doesn't hurt too much and you should be able to do this. So it goes on and on. So that's called peeling the layers of an onion. So uh, I want you to know that I try to deal with facts here. We don't always get the facts. I spend a lot of time peeling the layers of the onions and, and everywhere. And uh, when you do it, there are certain types of places where you don't have to peel the layers of an onion. You can get straight facts right away. Uh, and then the other thing is, when you hear from experts, sometimes you have to go to other experts in the same field, and they will say just the opposite of what an expert says. And then you've got to try to figure out which of these experts is right. So uh, and th that's very difficult. So uh, I want you to know that um, I, I do take that approach. And I do try to check out as many facts as I can uh, to go to the source wherever I can. I, I go down to the people that are in charge down at the town hall and to make sure I have my facts right. Or, or uh, if not, I'll change them before I even present them on the program. So often you may have to eliminate layers of reasons. Sometimes there are maybes. And sometimes there are plain excuses uh, with people are trying to lead you in the wrong direction until you get to the facts. The facts, facts must always be checked and rechecked with experts until they are verified or proven false. This is time consuming, hard work, and it helps to be a systems analyst. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the town of Winchester problem because they're half of the symbiotic relationship we're going to be talking about tonight. I've written papers on this, and I have a bibliography if anybody's interested in reading the whole paper. These are just snippets from the papers. But over the past 10 years, the town of Winchester's net grand list has grown at an average of about 3.52%. The net grand list is the, is the amount of the grand list in town, the amount of property that people own that is taxable, that you can uh, tax. And, um, and then a mill rate is figured out for how much of that grand list uh, uh, they will need for taxes. Uh, but anyway, so um, that has grown at about 3.52% over the last 10 years, or $16,026,447 a year. About 1%, 0.90%, or 25% of the 3.52%, uh, has come from additions to the taxpayer base. And that's very important to remember. What we need are additions to our taxpayer base. The only other alternative is to take it from the existing taxpayers. And that, that means that if you don't get additions to the taxpayer base, then the existing taxpayers shoulder all the load. Um, and I even go one step further and say we must have profitable additions to the taxpayer base. Uh, at taxpayer additions that do not consume more from the town than they give to the town. So, uh, so additions to the
taxpayer base are upgrades, additions that you do by permits, uh, upgrades that you do by permits, money comes in, and, and then that you're taxed on those if you had a porch or a third floor or a garage. Additional housing, new houses that come to town, buy a piece of land and build a new housing. That's why people are trying to encourage people to uh, sell town property so other people can come in and build on it and pay taxes. Um, and additional businesses that come to town, providing more come than leave, uh, then uh, even in the, they build a building or they don't build a building, but uh, um, it's very important that they do build a building or if they remodel a building, then we will make some money on that because uh, uh, their tax base will go up a little bit. And additional industries to town, so we'll talk a bit more later about that. Uh, the remainder, or 75% of the 3.52%, comes from property revaluation that we just went through one of those this year. That happens every five years now. The state has changed the rules a while back. It used to happen every 10 years. So until this latest valuation, the revaluations occurred every 10 years. So in the last five years, we've had two revaluations. Um, and I'm going to show you now the effect of that. In the 203, which was a 10-year revaluation, we hadn't had one for 10 years until 203, um, that was a 10-year valuation, and uh, that was the increase there was uh, about, uh, I got a page missing there somewhere, I always do that, but anyway, that rose, the uh, 203 rose our tax base by 26% for the average uh, property in town was 26% over 10 years, it, the valuation went up. Uh, the um, revaluation that this year was the first five-year revaluation, and it's called the statistical revaluation because they don't go into your house for it. Um, that revaluation increased the average property value by 40 percent, just over five years, and caused a lot of, a lot of interest in this town. So, uh, or in uh, 208, the first five-year revaluation, every other five years, now we will have a revaluation, and every other one will be a statistical revaluation. Next time in five years when they do a revaluation, and the property values could go down too in a revaluation, they did in Torrington a few years back, uh, then they go into your house in the next one. Whether they go into every house in town, I do not know. But basically, they have a right to go in your house, measure all your rooms, count all your bathrooms, and do all that. So that'll happen again in five years. The town budget, while well, all this has been happening, the town budget has grown at an average of 3.94%, or 1,026,000 per year over the last nine years. I only had information for the last nine years, so here I, I use nine years. Uh, and uh, the property taxes, uh, over the last nine years, the property taxes have increased at an average of 3.3%. Per year, so when people uh, when people say to me, Brian, you don't understand. The reason we're being held back as a town is because of the Taxpayers Association. I don't totally agree with that because over the last 10 years, we've averaged about 4 percent here uh, in taxes to the people that live here now. So that isn't too bad. You might be able to get the 5 percent. You might even be able to get the average 6 percent. But you would be for our town in the in the environmental uh, in the environmental shape it's in right now it'd be pretty hard to get five six percent on average over the years education our education in town is expensive and it's uh now about 61 percent of the amount to be raised from taxes so that's uh that's a very interesting figure the town is also dependent on various apparently unpredictable state of connecticut grants and a good percentage and they're a good percentage of the budget. These grants may or may not continue to flow in the future at the same advantageous rates as they have in the past. And we are vulnerable there as a town. We get quite a bit on the grant side because of the, uh, we're considered to be uh, grant worthy here for various statistical reasons uh, in the town. These statistics have not been enough assuming responsible spending to adequately maintain the town's infrastructure and provide certain service needs and desires. The town has limited resources. We're treading water. We're not getting ahead. And I'm going to point out a few examples of that in a few minutes. The town does not have much money 
to spend at Highland Lake on a regular basis to help them solve some of the problems that they have. Now examples of problems in the town, for those of you who aren't here all year round and probably don't know a lot of this, millions of dollars are needed to remedy neglected maintenance and upgrades to three of the four existing schools. Gilbert, the high school, private uh, high school, is accepted for now from my numbers here uh, because the school is relatively new. They may need some money too, I just don't know if they do or they don't, um, but uh, the, the other three schools certainly do. Millions of dollars are needed to remedy neglected maintenance and upgrades to the fire department, the town hall, the police department, and the fire, and the, I'm sorry, I got the fire department in twice, but roads, soldiers monument, uh, someday money will be needed probably for the senior center, and things like that. So we're talking millions here. The, the last year they tried to float a bond issue for 43 or 4 million, can't remember, over uh, uh, to be paid back over 20 years, which had 13 million in interest. So we're talking a lot of money here just to fix up our existing infrastructure. All that money from the bond issue wouldn't have made us a penny. All it would have done was fix up the existing infrastructure. We'd have better school, uh, more modern schools, more modern firehouses, more modern police department, things like that. But it wouldn't help us to get any revenue into town. Millions possibly needed to remedy the neglect of the old factory buildings you see around town when you drive around. And the first impression people get when they drive up Route 44 through our town uh, they do like, people do like uh, the work that Friends of Main Street's done on the, on the median strip, but they still, the first things that catch your eye are the factories, the old factory buildings, an environment in the center of town and elsewhere. The inability to provide enough material for public works to fix potholes around the lake and around town, pave streets, repair bridges, etc on a consistent basis because they don't have enough money. The, budgets, the budget doesn't have enough money for them to do that. So it's very hard to do the work if you don't have the materials, the tar, you know, all the things you need, cement, and everything you need to be able to do the job. Uh, the inability to attract enough major retail businesses and much needed industry to this town. The uh, industrial parks we have two of, they're pretty much full right now. There may be one vacancy in one of the industrial parks. Takes many years, probably 15 to 20, to, from the start of getting an industrial uh, park uh, established to getting it filled up and getting all the tax money in. So that's a long-term uh, situation. The relatively low test scores in the town schools can hinder our ability to attract industry and, not, and young executives to town, I am told. Young executives want to make sure that if they're working hard and a lot of hours and traveling around the world, that their children get a good, substantial education. And that's the first thing they look for when they, before they take a job. And I've been told that by a past head of the EDC and other people. So I, it's not Brian speaking. And I know when I travel the world, I always made sure that my children were in excellent schools and then I traveled the hour or two to work every day and back so they could be educated in schools that I felt very comfortable with. And when I found that I had them in a school that wasn't up to our standards, I moved them to another one. The population has stagnated. I don't know how many far year, years you go back, but we've been at 10,500 for a long, long time in this town. Various industrial skills have been reduced. We used to be a very skillful town. Now we have less skills, and that's hard to attract industry when you have less skills. Not impossible, but it's, uh, it's harder. We have to work on that. There was some discussion about that at the EDC on television a week ago. Various industry skills have been reduced, if not lost, to other communities. And uh, that's very important for people who want to bring industry to town. They want to make sure the schools are good for their employees' children, and they want to make sure that, uh, that um, they have the skills in, in the area, in the town, to be able to do the work they need. The declining student population at the Gilbert School mainly because of the loss of many students from Heartland in recent years. I'm told that Heartland gives vouchers now to their uh, families and they can go to any school they want to within reason. I don't know all the exact details, but 
we have lost quite a few students from Heartland in recent years. So to a certain extent, uh, that's helped force our cost per average student up. So we have a relatively high cost. I say relatively. Other people are higher, other people are lower. We have a relatively high cost of education in Winstead. The inability of the two major political parties, the minor pol uh, political party, and the taxpayers' associate parties, I guess, minor, and the taxpayers' association to work together harmoniously with the town leaders. That's one of the problems we have in the town uh, as well that has to be worked on. And we get a lot of bad publicity in the town. Business people don't like that. You know, if, you, uh, if, you have a, if you're a businessman and you have a business, you don't want bad publicity to get out about your business because you're trying to attract customers. So you have to be very careful about, same with your town. If you're trying to attract uh, industry to town and you're trying to attract developments to town and you're trying to attract uh, businesses of all sorts to town, then you have to have a good image and you have to work on it. Right now, we don't have that in the town, which is, in my opinion. Continual poor, uh, poor locate, uh, locally generated public relations in the newspapers. We get a lot of bad press. Some of it's generated by our own leaders, and that's not good. And we have to work on that, and that's another complaint that the local businessmen made at a, some of the local businessmen made at a summit meeting here a month or two ago. We have relative, uh, the, somebody from the state of Connecticut came to this summit meeting and said that Connecticut had a relatively slow land use board uh, decision making on large uh, developments and projects in Connecticut. And he, he actually said that in Connecticut, we take about a year in our land use board to do what other areas do in three months. So I've just taken his word for that. I don't know for sure. Haven't had time to go into all that yet. But that was what he told all our local leaders when he came to town. So. Uh, and then locally in Winstead, that's also a concern by our, our business people. The inability to fund the Highland Lake maintenance and improvements when needed, et cetera, um, is very also one of the town's problems because the, the town is, again, a symbiotic partner of the lake. They get a lot of their income from the lake. They get a lot of people attracted to town from the lake. You know, people used to come to see me from all over the world. I would take them to various uh, various restaurants, I'd take them to, to, to the stores, they would always load up on things before they left, not only Winston in the area, and once I went to a land use board and said I wanted to add a, a porch onto my house because I have a lot of guests coming, they spend a lot of money in town, and they kind of laughed at me and, and, uh, and threw me out. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that was a concern, I was going to spend like $100,000 on a new uh, thing. Now eventually I did get what I needed over time, but. Uh, but it was a shock to me uh, at the time. Now I'm going to talk about some problems and potential problems at Highland Lake. And uh, high taxes due to the relatively high property valuations. Um, Highland Lake is seen by New Yorkers in New England and Fairfield County and Boston and Hartford and other areas around, even other states, as a resort area. And it happens to be one of the least expensive uh, uh, resort areas between here and New York City. I mean, you get closer to New York City, the property values are double what they are here, maybe triple in some cases. So uh, and it is a lake and it is now kind of a resort area. It's not there for the factories anymore. So, uh, And it's there for not only people of Winchester and Winchester, but for the state. They have a boat launch there and there are people in the state are allowed to fish there and bring their boats in to a, within a certain uh, limitations and enjoy the lake. Um, the town is there's beaches up there where people can enjoy the lake, so uh, uh, that's that. Uh, the high taxes are due to relatively high property valuations, which may go down in the next revaluation, and they may go up. It depends what happens in the economy. And often people that buy around the lake, although it is slow in sales now, are often not concerned uh, too much about the economy if they've already made it and made their bundle. So, but. The economy does affect things. Things will slow down like they do everywhere else. Um, and then perhaps in 10, 20 years, start going again. I don't know. Um, but the Highland Lake District is now approximately 25% of the town's grand list. So the town is very dependent upon this money from the lake. Um, and uh, um, it's very important. Some believe that the lake does not receive its fair share of the services from the town for the amount of taxes paid by the Highland Lake District landowners. 
And this is controversial. Some people think we get a lot of services. We get all the roads plowed. We get them salted in the winter time. A lot of the people now, a certain percentage of the people now, do live around the lake year-round. There are more year-round homes there than there were when I was a child. Uh, but uh, there are people who think perhaps we could should get more police protection. Perhaps we should get more uh, money to help clear the lake and clean the lake, things like that. So. I want to say though that the service we do get from the town, we can always we can argue to the cows come home about whether we get enough or not. The service that is received is excellent. And every time I've needed a service from the town, um, I've been able to get excellent service. And when I go downtown, even for information in the town, I get anything I need and I get it pronto. And the people are always very very easy to deal with, and uh, I'm happy about that. Uh, next. Uh, the lake receives minimum allocations in the town budget each year. As a result, they, uh, as a result, uh, they're falling behind up there in maintaining and prevention of various possible water quality de deterioration. Now, um, it's very important, of course, that uh, the water quality is kept up to date. People at the lake are more are, are are very concerned about a lot of things up there, but the most important thing, in my opinion and since it, especially since I have a background in this kind of thing, is the water quality. And uh, a lot of things affect the water quality. And there's a lot of things that uh, people think affects the water quality, uh, uh, which may not affect the water quality. Now, there is a 60-page report that has just been handed in to the town by George Knockline, who's a very, very good uh, environmental scientist. He was used uh, by uh, various people for the public hearings for uh, the developments that are going to be, may or may not be coming to town. But uh, that, uh, it's called the evaluation of the Highland Lake um, drawdown, level drawdown. They're looking at that now with the commission uh, to see what's affecting the lake, whether drawdowns are affecting the lake or not affecting the lake. And George Knockline is a good person. Um, so uh, that'll be coming out. I will get a copy of that and I will read that and I might report on it on another I don't like special towards the end of the summer if it's worth doing. I don't know. But it will affect everybody on the lake because it, not right now they draw the, the water down eight feet every um, every uh, four years and then they have three years of three foot drawdowns and then now they're going to be changing that maybe, maybe not. But we should uh, be careful. So some examples of the lake stuff. The phosphate count has been increasing in water at Highland Lake for one reason or another over the last decade. The last real exhaustive study of the lake was done around 1980-ish, 76 and 80, and that time, I haven't got the, maybe not have exact years, but there, that is available. The state did a study. It was very exhaustive. It takes many years to do the study, and uh, you have to do it at different seasons and different depths and different temperatures and all that kind of thing to properly do the study. So. A costly and time-consuming study is recommended as necessary, not recommended by me, but recommended by uh, the environmentalists, uh, uh, is necessary to find the reason why and how to abate and or remedy the situation. Uh, so that that's something that, you know, is, takes a few years to do and costs some money because you've got to have experts doing it and they have to they do all the things they do. Uh, I don't know whether they have the state do it or private environmentalists or what, but one way or another, uh, that would need to be done. Uh, I do think someone's looking into that, but again, it takes money to do it. Silt continues to fill the coves around the lake, coming from the catch basins. Now they are upgrading the catch basins. They have just received a grant in 2056 to do some more. That'll be happening pretty quick. And the town's doing a good job at updating these catch basins and cleaning them out every year. They all have to be cleaned out every year, maybe more than once a year, I don't know, uh, yet to be replaced from the dirt roads, uh, getting stuff from the, uh, soap from the dirt roads around the lake. If you drive around the lake, you see a lot of dirt roads coming down in. And even where they put in catch basins, some of the local people tell me, Brian, the catch basins are doing a good job, but we're still getting a lot of silt coming in from these roads. And then uh, what they do is it comes down to dirt roads and uh, some of the driveways, and it goes over the road and washes into the lake. Uh, it also, uh, silt also comes in from streams, such as Str Str Sucker Brook, that need work by some funded effort. Either the Army Corps engineers, or we funded it or in the town, or some other state funding. But uh, 
that needs some work you know, it has for years and we keep hearing that well perhaps that can't be done because we can't get the uh, army corps of engineers to work they haven't got the money whatever the, the the reason may be at the particular time but that needs to be done eventually because uh, a friend of mine had a daughter water skiing a couple of years ago, or not a daughter, but a, a niece or nephew, and, and uh, the skis hit the sandbar and splattered it all over her. That's how, how tough it is in that Suckerbrook Cove. And in the wintertime, when the water's down eight feet or three feet even, you could see that. So it's filling up. When I went around with my petition a few years ago, almost every cove was somebody told me, this cove is filling up. Coves that I used to swim in at state beaches when I was a kid, at town beaches when I was a kid. One lady came by my house last year with a fellow walker and said, Brian, can I swim off your deck? And I said, of course you can swim off my deck. And I said, why do you need to swim off my deck? Well, it's so hard to swim in our cove now because it's full, it's full of weeds and it's full of, um, you know, plant growth. So it's kind of hard for these people to swim there. So uh, that is happening, happening, and it takes money to do all that work and to fix all that up. Eventually, some of the coves, and perhaps some other areas of the lake, may need dredging at a large private or public expense. I know one, at least one resident has gone and got a permit to be able to dredge in front of his property personally. It's a little tricky because he has to leave the equipment on the bank and he can only dredge as far as he can reach with the, with the, with the uh, mechanical equipment. But um, so. There's going to be, now when I say this, don't anybody get too scared. I mean, this might be 20 years from now or 10 years from now or 30 years from now. I don't know when, but we're not going in the right direction as far as silt coming into the lake. We are making progress, but we have a long way to go. The lake suffers from the existence of invasive plants that must be treated. Um, and. Uh, either by drawdowns, and there's still some confusion about how much the drawdowns help here in this, in this area. It does help a little bit, I guess, but, uh, and uh, they needed, uh, uh, sometimes we put in, um, we, we put things into the lake called diquat. Uh, I don't really want to call it a poison because I don't know exactly what it is, but it does maim these uh, milfoil plants, invasive milfoil plants, and um, it, uh, it doesn't kill them, it doesn't get to the roots, so they grow back, and uh, they grow back over time. So it's a continuous problem. Uh, they are looking with George Knockline into that and seeing you know, how big a problem it is and you know, what more may be necessary for that. So uh, the next thing is uh, there is an increased number of boats and other water vehicles that pop possibly stir up the lake bed and possibly import unwanted plants. They may not be doing enough now. We don't wash boats when they come into our boat launch. They bring in whatever is on there, uh, stuck on their hull from any other lake. And so far, I guess we've been pretty lucky. I have talked to the state about this, and they've said that we don't think we are in the position yet where we have to wash boats at the uh, boat launch. And that was about a year ago. I don't think anything's changed since then. The roads are salted during the winter. Some salt finds its way to the lake. And the salt can kill trees along the road, been known to do so. You'll see a lot of people cutting down trees along the road. And when I talk to the tree experts uh, that are cutting them down, they always say this tre the tree's either dead or dying fast from the salt. Now, we do put less salt around, and we don't put any sand around anymore, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, over the last year or so. So we're making progress in that area as well. Um, but the salt can kill trees along the, uh, the road over a period of time. Although a responsible effort is made, the Highland Lake water quality can most likely be more professionally evaluated, in my opinion. If we had money and we could do, uh, spend more on evaluating the lake every year by professionals, uh, then uh, that probably would be good for us. But again, you need money. Now, as far as circulating pipes embedded in causeways, they may have clogged over the years. You know, and when you get around these coves and there's, uh, if there's uh, causeways, it's nice to have the water go through the causeway through pipes and uh, so it circulates the water. And some of these may have clogged over the years and may need attention by the, by the Public Works Department. Um, some residents believe that more ordinance, comma, law, and regulation enforcement in one form or another 
on or off the water may be needed. This is a big concern at the lake, whether it's accurate or it's really needed or not. There's all kinds of opinion. It tends to be one of the most talked about subjects on the lake. And that, if that is true, then maybe the police need more uh, people in, a, in the summer to help. Maybe the uh, inspectors need more help, more money to help. But everything kind of boils down to money and how much money is allocated. The, uh, as far as I can see, somebody in the last year tried to uh, put a private boat control together where they just went out and tried to help uh, on the lake. And uh, it said this year in the paper that they didn't get enough volunteers to continue it again. So it's a th tough thing. So now, what's the most probable solution? Um, first, I think before I do that, I want to talk about, I just put them out of order here, so I'm going to move them in. into my space here, and then I'll talk about the most probable solution. Um, the first thing I want to say is that, before I talk about the most probable solution, I just put them out of, out of order here, sorry about that. Uh, the options that are available here for the town and the lake to get money enough to be able to solve all these problems we have here in town and on the lake and future problems, prevent them, start saving now so if we ever have to dredge any parts of the lake, we have the money saved in an account. Uh, or, if, you know, in order to fix up the schools, we save some money up and go there. But these are the options. You can raise taxes by all the existing taxpayers. That's very unpopular and difficult to do in Winstead. We have a strong taxpayers association, and they've been able to keep the taxes over the last 10 years down to an average of 4%. Um, and uh, and uh, as a result, a lot of things have been neglected. It isn't just, I'm not blaming anybody for this, but because we didn't get, we don't have more money for one reason or another, all those neglections have happened. We can borrow money. When you borrow money, you can get float bonds, you can get bank loans, et cetera, et cetera, borrow from Uncle Ernie, whatever. But then you gotta pay interest. You gotta pay interest for 20 years. So you're really adding a lot, and all that interest you pay, you can't do other things with. So that kind of should be a last resort, but, uh, but it is an option. And uh, the next is to add additional, by the way, when you do that, you just add to this, raise the taxes, right? One of these things they're struggling with this year is they don't like the fact that we have this tax increase this year. Part of it is to pay for the 206-5 bond issue, which did a lot of good around town. Uh, add additional taxpayers to share the burden, which I think is the way to go. And those taxpayers can come from business, additional taxpayer, industry, or residential. Um, and uh, the next is grants. We're always getting grants one way or the other, but when we get a grant, we also have to put up our share of that. Say 30% of, of the money has to come from us, and in order to get that, now we've been raising taxes to do that. And then donations. We don't get any donations. If you go down to the town and look at a donation line in the town budget, it's usually zero. Most probable solution. Increase the profitable tax base of the town over the medium to long term, five to 15 years. The most likely candidates for that are two big developments that are going up on the hills along the Route 8 corridor between Winston and Torrington. They're not really going up. They, uh, they're trying to get their permits squared away so they can begin to build. One of them's called the Highland Ridge Estates and St. Anne's Country Club Development. 456 age-restricted units with a big golf course, 18-hole uh, golf course, and a clubhouse, and other amenities up there, swim pool and thing like that, which will bring millions of do dollars into our town and our economy, not only in Winston, but in the whole area. Aurora State Development, which is, uh, by the way, this Highland Ridge Estates has received permission for planning and zoning and our in the wetlands. It's still waiting for permission from uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and the uh, State Department of DE, the uh, Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, mainly because of the golf course and, and uh, uh, how that's going to be handled. The Aurora Estates Development is 125 mixed-use units. That's a compromise that's been off by, offered by, uh, uh, actually discussed between the town and the developers. They have been refused this twice already. Uh, they have put in a, uh, with the Litchfield Court, they put in a, um, um, the, an appeal, and they're now talking about a compromise that'd be 125 mixed-use units. That means you can have children, and that would be about 35 children, uh, which would go into our school systems, and I think we have room to handle them. 
uh, and 100 age-restricted units, uh, which are a 55 and older, no children uh, allowed. Uh, that's the most uh, probable uh, solution to us. And uh, I'm gonna flip this, I got these in here twice somewhere. Uh, according to expert public testimony on record in the town hall, you could get this in the in the wetlands and in the planning development department. You know, the records down there would fill half a room, but uh, just on these two developments. But if you go down there and ask for the information, you can get it. Uh, according to the expert public hearing testimony on record in the town hall, and that mean the town had experts, the lake had experts, and the developer had experts. Developers' experts were Yale, from Yale, actually, and uh, they say that the project should not harm Highland Lake. Um, Matter of fact, they even said if they didn't do any mitigation, they shouldn't harm Highland Lake. The Highland Ridge Estates and St. Anne's Country Club, uh, uh, oh, sorry, they should not, oh, I mix those up. Uh, it also should not harm the Canavo Spring. That was another big issue they came up. Will it harm the Canavo Spring? And the answer was uh, no, it should not. And then uh, will blasting harm the local wells around the Highland Lake District and around its development? The answer by the experts was no, they, uh, they, they will not. So, um, and they passed through both uh, in the wetlands and, and planning and zoning after very careful scrutiny. They also agreed to do some water quality, putting water quality uh, monitoring equipment at the suggestion of some of the experts of the town and the lake, and so they could watch it over the years and see if, uh, if uh, these uh, facts continue to be facts or if there's uh, deteriorating and may hurt the lake. Uh, there's a minimum recurring overhead to the town by these. They're going to do most of the infrastructure themselves. They're putting in the road. They're running the sewer and water up to their property. There's a lot of things they're paying for and uh, have offered to pay for. Um, so it's a minimum cost also to the town for implementation. It will add millions to the recurring tax base. There will be another roughly 1,600 taxpayers up there, uh, and uh, it will add that, plus the other taxes that will come in uh, from uh, the, the golf course and the clubhouse and, uh, and from all kinds of uh, permit fees, one-time permit fees, probably a thousand a house or so, maybe a little less. Uh, they'll also have to pay a significant amount for water and sewer hookup fees. Water hookup fees in Winston are $1,000 a house and sewer hookup fees $1,000 a unit. And uh, that's a lot of money when you're putting in uh, 450, 550, almost 700 uh, units. They'll pay a significant amount of recurring water and usage fees. One of the things that come out in the public hearings, as it always does, is we have plenty of water. We have a magnificent water facility in this town built some years ago. And uh, sewer capacity, we have enough sewer capacity, so we're in good shape there. And uh, uh, this, this, uh, these developments will also provide jobs for the town and the surrounding area. So uh, it's going to take over the first five years of this development. These developments are going to empower a lot of people put a lot of money into the town for jobs, for people to do the construction and do all the work, and same for all of the county and even the state to a certain extent as they bring in people from around to help get this thing going. There'll be also some permanent jobs in there, taking care of the golf course and the clubhouse and the amenities and facilities. So uh, this is very important that we get these jobs for the surrounding area. Now, water quality measuring devices, as I said earlier, will be placed around the projects for monitoring purposes so that the town can monitor the year-to-year uh, -year improvement here up at this lake. Now, I'd like to say, i still got a few minutes left, more than I thought I'd have at this particular time, but I want to say to you people at the lake, I don't know what kind of information you get about this when you're away. I'm not sure it's always the most accurate information, although I have no reason to question it. I don't read any of that information that they sent to you, but um, um, a lot of good has been done by the town and the lake people to make sure the checks and balances were placed on these developments and projects. They didn't. The first one did manage to pass through. The second one had a little bit of problem with density and it was refused and then it came back again and it was still a little too dense for the planning and zoning people 
and maybe even a little too far for some of our public services like the fire department and, and police department. But that has now been reduced to 225. The other night when I went to the planning and zoning meeting, the planning and zoning uh, uh, the group uh, voted unanimously to get together with the developer and the town planner and whoever else and try to come up with a positive, uh, you know, a configuration that could pretty well possibly be um, agreed by the town and then put to a, town, a public hearing so people can vote on this. So usually when you go to these public hearings, you'll find they're mostly neighbors that are kind of uh, very interested in what's happening and wanting to see it done properly and they raise a lot of questions and that's good because that's a good checks and balance and often uh, um, they also say a lot of things that are irrelevant but you know that's that's natural we're human beings uh, I'm always quiet at these meetings and I listen because I'm a systems analyst and I read the minutes and notes and then I contemplate and ask experts and then try to form an opinion so I've been to every single meeting of the first uh, development bar one and I listen to all the testimony uh, it was difficult on me because my back hurt and uh, everything else from the hard chair sitting there for three, four, five, six hours in a meeting. But um, I mean, I'm convinced that unless uh, something we don't know about happens, um, these are not going to be a detriment to this town or to the lake. They're going to be, the, could be, the biggest thing that ever happened to this town because what they will do is allow us then to take the money that comes in from the taxes and begin to clean up the town, refurbish the town, get the schools brought up to specification, maybe even get a new school over the years, get the fire departments uh, uh, squared away, get the police department squared away, get enough people downtown where necessary. And some people argue we don't need any more people, but in some cases we may need a few more people. Um, the developer has actually agreed to pay for people to work for the town to help monitor his his uh, project. So uh, they, in that case, the town would probably hire consultants uh, to keep an arm's length and have them ch double check on everything. So I think that's good. So uh, if you can, try to find out more about these projects. Call me if you need to. I've got plenty of information and plans and all kinds of things I put out. Go down and talk to the inland wetlands and, uh, people. Go talk to the planning and zoning uh, planning. Talk to the town manager. Um, talk to any of the selectmen. Uh, some of the selectmen don't agree too much uh, with these projects, but most of them do. So you'll get both sides of the story. Then make up your own mind. And uh, I think you're going to find that uh, it's going to take a long time to get any money in from these developments. But right now, it's the only game in town. All the other avenues will be, um, will be progressed by the Economic Development Commission, and the town manager, and the selectmen. But none of them will bear fruit for five years or so and five, five to 15 years. So we need to start planning now, not only for the town, but also for the lake. So when we do need these things fixed, because of, we're getting more and more deterioration all over the place, we will have some money to do it, and we will have some money to match well, bond, uh, bond uh, offers that we get from various places. With that, I'd like to thank you very much. And Lydia, I hope you enjoy this lake forever. Thank you. This is Brian O'Haran. This is the second Highland Lake Special of this weekly program, Planning for Success. During the first special program, I pointed out many of the reasons for the town and Highland Lake to be financially reliant on one another because both could, now and in the future, be dealing with some very expensive problems. 
Tonight's program is a further elaboration on the water quality needs of Highland Lake in the near future. Who knows what costs and time frames the recommendations and findings of this report will bring or where the money will come from. The revenue from the major developments and golf course under consideration in the hills along the Enterprise Corridor may provide the answer if they materialize in time to help. Hi, right, thanks a lot. Here we go. I'm going to start out with the agenda this evening. Uh, I'm going to talk just a couple minutes about the budget, notices, a couple notices. Then I've got a disclaimer that I've, I've been asked to uh, to say a few words about the report as a disclaimer. And then um, I'm going to spend most of the program on a draft report, as I promised uh, last week I would, called the Evaluation of Lake Level Drawdown at Highland Lake, Winchester, Connecticut. This draft report uh, was uh, uh, done in July, July 10th of 2008. The budget, uh, there was a meeting last night and it basically didn't change the budget. You can read about it in the newspaper. I'm going to go kind of fast today because I want to spend all the time on the report. But uh, the third town budget referendum will be held from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday, September 6th, 2008 at the Pearson School. Proposed tax increase, 0.71 mills or 2.88%. Uh, the new mill rate will be the existing mill rate, 24.67 that you got in your bills a, um, a few weeks back, plus 0.71, an additional 0.71 mill. So the total mill rate, um, if this budget passes, will be 25.38 mills. Now, it may, it may not pass, in which case we have to go back through the process once more. Uh, they, do, they are talking about having a question on it this time. May or may not happen. We'll know that on, probably on Monday night uh, at the selectmen meeting. As far as notices are concerned, a date of August 18, 2008 was set for a special town meeting for the sale of lots 24 through 34, 29 through 34, located on East Wakefield Boulevard to be held in the P. Francis Hicks room at 7 p.m. Please come. Uh, and help to get this land on the tax rolls if you're interested in, in, in uh, maintaining, uh, getting get the taxes as low as uh, practical. The second required Charter Revision Commission public hearing concerning recommendations to the selectmen regarding uh, recommended charter changes will be held on Wednesday, August 19, 2008 at 7 p.m. in the band room at Pearson School. Please come if interested. Copies of the recommendation to the selectmen, which is basically for a mayoralty form of government voted for uh, by four of the five members, and a minority report, uh, which is uh, basically uh, a, a strengthened town manager form of government, are available in the town clerk's office. I went down there today and checked, and they are there. There's not a lot of copies of some of them, but there's enough, so uh, if you need one, they'll make it up for you. Now I want to start with the lake concerns. This is not the lake report that I'm going to be talking about. These are Brian's comments here. Uh, all, the, all lakes have, and I've been involved with, uh, in, in producing sensors for monitoring not only lakes but oceans around the world down to a uh, depth of four miles, um, electronically monitoring all kinds of uh, different uh, things. So uh, I do have some experience with it. I'm not a limnologist. I'm not an expert a, a, in that area. But I do know a lot about the instruments that are used and the techniques and, and the uh, things like that. I actually was uh, chief operating officer of a company for seven years that manufactured these along with other electronic medical equipment and things like that. Our attempts, uh, first thing we want to say is all lakes kind of age. They're just like we do. They age. And uh, they get older and older and older. And I did read a few years back where if the Grand Coulee Dam was left alone in 1,000 years, it would, uh, it would fill up with silt. There is a lake in, in, around, in the area that I used to go fishing on that now has about an inch of water on top of uh, a silt, and that's only in my life, in my lifetime. It's a, more of a pond than a lake. But, uh, so over time, there is a natural tendency for lakes to age and nature to try to take them back. And our attempts to help the lake, uh, we, we, we as human beings, try to help the lake have a longer 
useful life if we're living around it or it's in our area. Some are out in the wilderness that nobody cares about, they'll just naturally age. While still allowing people to enjoy the lake and its many benefits. So there's a challenge at all the time at Highland Lake and, and the challenge is the water quality and I'm not going to talk much about the history here tonight, but uh, the present problems mainly. Water quality versus the need to protect the structures around the lake, and there are about 450 of them we'll talk about tonight, uh, from ice damage uh, during the winter, and allow timely, affordable, and sound, soundly engineered additions and repairs when needed in a timely manner. So. We've got this sort of battle going between these things at all times, and the structures, not all of them are for enjoyment. Some of them are, are walls uh, uh, that uh, uh, keep the, uh, uh, the lake from washing away the land, uh, some of which, most of which has cottages on one way or another. So there's a continual battle there. Uh, the pesticide diquat is now applied each year in areas where uh, where it's planned and approved, and the DEP has to also approve this. Now, let me just say that uh, this is a bit like uh, putting diquat in the lake. It's a pesticide. It's about it's it's like taking a uh, human being taking uh, blood pressure medicine or or uh, sugar diabetes medicine. It's there to help prolong uh, the uh, use of the lake, and uh, and uh, that's put in every year now in certain areas of the lake. Um, the lake is drawn down by three feet annually and six to eight feet every three or four years. Uh, the latest schedule has been more like three years, but over the longer period of time it's um, sometimes four years. Uh, a new schedule is needed for the near uh, future. So our existing five-year schedule for lake drawdowns um, is up, uh, I guess, this year, so they need a new five-year schedule. I think they left it kind of late to be doing these studies and to be getting, I mean, we only got a few more months before the ice comes. So um, I would have done this a year ago and had it all ready, and then uh, we wouldn't have to be rushing at the last minute here to, to get these decisions made. But anyway, there is a, uh, a committee forum to look into the drawdown at the lake, and they asked for a report. Uh, a report has been commissioned by this committee to help with the evaluation I will be discussing that report tonight. Well, you should see, as of now, and pretty quick, uh, some milfoil. Uh, they're going to talk a lot about milfoil tonight. That'll be up in, on the wall in back of me, and I hope it comes out as I planned. Okay, now we're going to talk about the report itself, and it's called The Evaluation of Lake Development Drawdown at Highland Lake Draft. It's a draft report. I forgot to say that last week. I apologize for that. July 2008. It was prepared for the Highland Lake Water Level Committee in the town of Winchester, and it was prepared by Northeast Aquatic Research, LLC, which is uh, George W. Knockline. I didn't get a chance to call Mr. Knockline and get his exact uh, pedigree, but I, I think pretty sure he's a limnologist, and I, I have had experience uh, with uh, in meetings where, you know, in public hearings and things where uh, he was working on these major developments, and I was always very impressed with him, as I said last week. Now, I just want to put up a quick disclaimer. You always got to have disclaimers here because a lot of people watching here are hoping you make a mistake so they can jump on you. But the report is a draft report, and more information may be available in the future. If there's more information becomes available, then, um, then uh, I get a hold of it, I, and I'll keep my eye out for it, and I'll pass it on to everybody. Everybody. Uh, a lot of people have been asking for copies of this report from my neighbors and me and other people, so it is getting distributed, and uh, that's good. The Water Level Committee had a three-hour presentation and discussion with Dr. Knockline, who was reviewing this report that he submitted. I did not attend, as I am only interested in his documented analysis and the recommendations as a scientist. It's a bit like uh, Einstein's theory. You don't have to talk to Einstein to understand what, he was, what he's written down on a piece of paper. So um, uh, I'm interested in the report and anything that's in, uh, put in the public domain as an official scientific report. Some of the people, co committee members, this, uh, their comments and all, that doesn't interest me too much because they have different backgrounds and uh, he is the scientist that they uh, hired for $11,000 to do this report. I did not discuss this report with Dr. Knockline. I read the report and uh, 
and I take it on face value, and if more information comes out, uh, then we'll let you know. If further reports are, uh, are produced by Dr. Knockline that add to the summary and or recommendations, which is the most important part to me of this, uh, I will make them available to you on a future, further program in the future. I don't know when this stuff will come out, so I can't tell you when, but uh, we'll go with that. As usual, any mistakes in presenting the information from the report are mine. And once apprised of any factual errors, uh, and I find them to be true, a lot of people tell me I made errors that turn out not to be true, but if they're true, then I will correct them in a future program. We're not out here to fool anybody. We're just trying to get pass along information so people can make their own decisions and, uh, and have as much information as possible. So the report itself, and you know, I'll just put this up here for a minute. I did this last time, too. This is the report. It's got a picture of a deep drawdown here. This is the report. It's about 64 pages, double-sided, uh, uh, so divide by two, and that's the number of pages in the report, but no, it's double-sided. Um, so uh, the report contains a table of contents, which I'm not going to go through here tonight. You can get a copy of the report if you want to see that. A list of figures, and this list of figures is important statistics in one form or another, many forms of these statistics, um, contained in the document. So there's a list of figures in there, it's in one page or so. There's a list of tables, again, more important statistics contained in the document, these more in tablet, ta tablature form here. So the next one is a list of maps, important maps and survey results contained in the document. There's some very nice uh, um, maps and from various reports and various studies and all these collected together, and they are in the report. And the body of the report itself, and then nicely at the end, as in all scientific documents, there's a bibliography. And uh, a lot of good information in that bibliography. And if you got a hold of the bibliography alone and read each of the uh, references he has in there, you'd really learn a lot. Now, you know, it takes, uh, there's an awful lot of information on this in, the, in this world, so uh, it, it takes experts to really understand this and pass the information on. It's not an amateur game here. Uh, this evening, I will only have time to present almost verbatim. I left out a couple articles and prepositions just to, to make the slides easier, but this evening I will have time to present almost verbatim the goals of the report as stated in the introduction to the report, page 9, the summary as stated in the document, page 6, and the recommendations as stated in the report, page 7, by Dr. Knockline. You can obtain a copy of the report from the Inland Wetlands Office at the Town Hall. There may be a charge of $16 or so or whatever they're charging now. So with that, I'll go to goals of the report, page 9. This is right from the report, almost verbatim. When there are comments I make that are mine, I will tell you. Review available aquatic plant survey data in order to determine if winter lake level drawdown at Highland Lake successfully controls aquatic rooted plants, especially Eurasian milfoil. Now, there are two forms of this milfoil, and we'll talk about that, I think, in a few more minutes, but uh, um, it's an invasive plant. It means it's not domestic. It's brought in one way or another, or gets there one way or another by the wind or by boats or, or somehow. Uh, into the lake. Uh, next, it will describe the different potential impacts due to water level drawdown. Evaluate, number three, evaluate whether there is any evidence of direct or indirect impacts to the environmental health of Highland Lake due to the drawdown. Number four, assess the use of lake level drawdown as a method of weed control in light of the full suite of weed control strategies. And number five, supplement the existing lake management plan, there was a plan done uh, years ago, to include additional information needs, monitoring protocols, water quality targets, and critical issues that will assist in evaluating water level drawdown at Highland Lake. Now I will go to page six of the report, which is the summary. Those were the goals. This is the summary. 
and then there will be recommendations. The summary is on page six. Winter water level drawdown has been used at Highland Lake for the past 25 years or so as a simple way to control nuisance aquatic plant, uh, plants, I should say plants, uh, the freezing and drying causes the rooted plants to be killed. The invasive plant species, and I just use uh, the uh, English here, I didn't use the Latin, but uh, Eurasian milfoil and variable leaf milfoil are two types here in the lake. Um, the two, two invasive plant species, Eurasian milfoil and variable leaf milfoil, infest the shallow water around the lake. The drawdown provides an inexpensive way to keep the milfoil from proliferating around the shoreline. However, to date, no attempt has been made to evaluate whether the drawdown has been effective at removing milfoil or if there have been any impacts to the lake health due to the drawdown. This report provides the first comprehensive assessment of the benefits and detriments of winter water level drawdown at Highland Lake. Been going on for 25 years. Aquatic plant surveys conducted at Highland Lake were analyzed along with details of the water level records and water depth contours to determine the areas of the lake where aquatic plant control probably occurs. The lake is drawn down by three feet annually and eight feet every three or four years. It's actually six to eight feet. Uh, there's a little bit of a swing there. The eight feet is very necessary because in order to uh, redo walls, sea walls and things, you need to get at foundations and they're, uh, they're pretty deep. So you need to get to almost to the eight feet. And, and, and uh, Brian's comment here, and it says later in the report, it takes half the winter to get down eight feet when they do have a, a deep drawdown, the other half the winter to get back up to a normal level again for the summer. So there's not much time at all when it's down eight feet you know, under normal circumstances. Okay, uh, the lake is drawn down by three feet annually and eight feet every three or four years, as I said. The water depth contours of the lake indicated that the repeated drawdown effects of the zero to three foot zone of the lake annually affected control over approximately 30 acres. That means when it's drawn down three feet, Brian's comment here, uh, there's about 30 acres of exposed uh, lake bottom that uh, freeze and thaw and, uh, and probably help control the milfoil. During the deep drawdown, back to the report again, during the deep drawdown, the duration of exposure is probably only long enough between zero and six feet to affect plant control. The area between, there's a word here, probably. You always have to look for these kind of words in these reports. This is a bit like, and this is Brian's comment, this is a bit like uh, dealing with uh, uh, people uh, that deal with the economy, you know, six and one, half a dozen the other, some say this, some say that, you know, and there's a lot of conditional words used in these reports. But exposure is probably only long enough between zero and six feet to affect plant control. The area between zero and six feet is approximately 60 acres. So if we were down uh, six feet, then we would have 60 acres, uh, acres exposed. And they're exposed, Brian's comment, for different periods of time because it takes a while to get down a foot, then you get down another foot, then you get down another foot. That takes time, so they're not all exposed for the same amount of time. Back to the report. Aquatic plant mapping conducted over the last four years, combined with more historical survey data, suggests that the drawdown has been successful at controlling milfoil in at least the zero the three-foot water depth area of the lake. There is evidence that in some areas the milfoil is controlled out to six feet. However, mapping shows the milfoil grows out to 12 feet in some areas and may grow to deeper depths. The milfoil in the deeper depths is not affected by the drawdown. Recent surveys 
show that some species of native aquatic plants rapidly, rapidly populate the drawdown areas by mid to late summer. The prevalence of these species appears to be increasing in density and abundance over the years. This suggests that drawdown may be selecting, now we're getting into natural selection and different forms of, uh, of this stuff, but may be selecting for tolerant species and other less tolerant native species. Winter drawdown also provides additional benefit by allowing homeowners an opportunity to perform maintenance on shorefront structures. And Brian's comment here, it's, it is in the back of the report, but I just say these structures are uh, retaining walls, uh, piers, uh, beaches, um, and uh, in, some, in some cases the actual foundation and some of the cottages on the lake, uh, six or eight or nine of those. So there are different types of structures um, that are there. There are, there are approximately 450 permanent shoreline structures that are fully or partially underwater during the normal summer water levels. Winter water level drawdown also serves to protect these structures from damage. And I want to add here, this is Brian's comment, not only do they help protect them from damage when we do winter uh, water level drought, but allows you to repair and rebuild or to build new structures if you have permits from the town to do so. And we are still getting permits from the town to rebuild walls and to build walls and uh, those kind of things. Winter water drawdown has a potential to cause a number of detriments including increased lake water nutrient content, increasing loss of dissolved oxygen in deep water, the company I owned part of uh, uh, made dissolved oxygen sensors that were used all over the world, uh, impact to fisheries and to fish habitat, mortality to vertebrates and invertebrates, broadening the range of invasive plants by causing deeper water growth. Desiccation, now I, I put a little um, <clears throat> what it means here. That word is a, probably a word you're not familiar with, I'm not that familiar with it, but that uh, means dried up or dehydrated. So desiccation of contiguous shoreline, shore wetlands, shore erosion and slumping, and resuspension of bottom sediments. Drawdowns may also distance the lake from shorefront properties, making access to the lake difficult or impossible and create floating, floating mud islands. Brian's comment, this usually happens in the coves, in the deep coves. And um, the, the coves were kind of created when they raised the water levels <laughs> in the last century uh, or so, uh, or even before that, uh, around the lake. Uh, so. Uh, we do have coves, and as I mentioned on a program, a previous program, they are filling up with silt, many of them, and, uh, and weeds and things. Okay, next, back to the report. Examination of the water quality record indicates that the bottom water phosphorus concentrations may be increasing, especially after deep drawdown. Water column dissolved oxygen measurements show that over the past 35 years, the levels of dissolved oxygen in the deeper waters of the lake have been decreasing to the point where the typical summer condition in South Bay is for water below about 25 feet to contain no oxygen. This is the report speaking here. And the water below 35 feet in Middle Bay to contain no oxygen during the summertime. During extreme seasons, both middle and South Bay have no oxygen below 20 feet. In contrast to data collected in the 1930s that showed plentiful oxygen down to 65 feet. The Sechi disk, a measure of water clarity, indicates that the clarity 
of the water has remained somewhat stable over the last 30 years with an average sachi disk transparency of 14.5 feet. Repre repeated occurrence of mud islands have been reported from the shallow bays around the lake. These mud islands form as the lake refills and lifts buoyant, par uh, partially dried lake sediments that have a high percentage of peat composition. Floating mud islands are blown to shore by prevailing winds. Once the mud island runs aground, it sinks, depositing the bottom sediments on the shoreline. The distance of the winter ice from the shore in some of the coves is extensive. You can see that a lot of these coves, uh, Brian's comment here, uh, a lot of these coves are pretty well empty during the uh, deep drawdown. And that is a concern for people who live in the coves because if, now that they're living there all year round or when they come for their uh, winter vacations, they see um, mud or um, ice on top of mud or whatever. So it's not the most pleasant view. But on the other hand, um, the deep drawdown is necessary for people that don't live in the coves that need to do work when they live in deep water. Distances of 200 to 300 feet are common in the shallow coves of the lake. Some selected areas have distances of 400 to 500 feet from shore to winter ice cover. The long distance to winter ice covering during the deep drawdown also means that slope is very shallow and the sediments are predominantly wet mud that does not freeze. Now Brian's comment, if it doesn't freeze then guess what, it doesn't kill the roots of the milfoil or whatever other invasive uh, things we're trying to deal with and uh, that's an important point right there. Because the mud does not freeze it is impossible to transverse these sediments to reach the ice cover. So, you know, it's hard to walk across it, Brian's comment, um, to, to reach the ice. You have to go around the road to another point or something. So it's a little difficult there and it is an inconvenience for people who want to get out on the ice uh, to fish and do things like that, or skate, uh, or do any winter sports. Fisheries records do not show any obvious signs of population effect of specific species impacts. There is no data available that the drawdown has impacted the turtle population. Every once in a while I do see a nice big turtle walking across the road in front of my property on uh, West uh, Wakefield Boulevard and they're pretty big too, some of these turtles. A recent survey of freshwater mussel showed that the lake contained a large number of a different species of mussels that occurred mostly in waters deeper than six to seven feet. There is an interest now in a rare form of mussel that's in the lake. The DEP has taken an interest in that. And uh, they're, um, they're watching it very closely uh, to see whether or not we should continue to use Dyquat or not. I guess uh, this year they allowed us to put the Dyquat in but I think they're still studying it for the future. Now I'm going to talk about Dr. Knockline's uh, recommendations in his report. I touched on these at the, last, um, at the last program, but now I've gone into much more detail here. Uh, this first point is that the draw, drawdown may be justified exclusively based on the number of permanent structures that might be damaged by ice. Now in blue here, I've added Brian's comments because I'm going to write him a letter, Dr. Knockline, and I'm going to give him some feedback here. But my comment on this one is that we should add the need for extensive repair or construction of structures old or new. But that's not part of this report. That's Brian's comment. In case the drawdowns down is causing significant impacts to water quality, it may have to be reconsidered in light of continued loading of the lake with nutrients and degradable oxygen consumable materials. 
and then he makes a recommendation, a drawdown scenario should be developed specifically with ice protection in mind. And I've added again Brian's comment. I said add in and structure building and repair. So it's just as important to, to, to in Brian's view here, it, not to just have the drawdown uh, to keep to protect the walls from deteriorating, but also to when you have the deep drawdown to be able to repair a wall, tear it down, rebuild a new one, put in a new wall if you have permission to do so, and that that uh, comes from the in the Wetlands Commission and the Planning and Zoning, whoever else looks into those things. So there's that comment. Now, one of the recommendations he makes here is, and I don't know if you'll be able to read this with this green, but uh, I'll read it to you. What he recommends, and these little stars here mean his recommendation, collect inventory data on all permanent structures around the lake to determine the water drawdown required to protect each from ice damage. And I've added Brian's comment again, it's the same comment, and to allow for periodic repair and construction of the structures when necessary. The use of drawdown as a plant control strategy, strategy this is Dr. Nockline, the use of drawdown as a plant control strategy is inconclusive at this time. Available data has not been collected with sufficient water depth references to make accurate assessment of species control or po uh, control or repopulation in the drawdown zones. I got two controls in here. So assessment of species control or repopulation in the drawdown zones. Well, observations are also lacking needed resolution to show if drawdown has controlled milfoil in the shallow coves where mud is not dewatered because of either gentle slopes or upland water resources. Although drawdown may provide some control over milfoil between zero and three feet, and notice it says some control over milfoil between zero and three feet of water depth, or zero and six feet of water depth, milfoil also grows in extensive beds out to 12 feet of water and, and deeper. Drawdown may be causing a shift in the aquatic plant community from sensitive to tolerant species. Continued drawdown may allow these tolerant species to become extremely dense and abundant. In effect, the milfoil is being replaced by other species. Recommendation, these two little stars, collect detailed aquatic plant mapping data that cross-references the species present to the water depths of both deep and shallow drawdown control zones. Second recommendation in that category is inventory aquatic plant growth in areas of both steep and shallow water depth contours. So these are studying type activities that he's recommending here. Number three here uh, is net third point. Deep water dissolved oxygen may be the most serious consequence of the drawdown. More frequent dissolved oxygen data is needed to track this condition over time. It is also imperative that deep water summer phosphorus levels are closely measured because the two processes, oxygen loss and phosphorus increases, are directly related. It is critical, it's a nice word, critical, that the rate and magnitude of these two actions be known in detail. There is also no early season data on any of the water quality parameters. If drawdown has been increasing, nutrient levels of the water during the winter or early spring 
It has gone unmeasured. So his actions are collect oxygen temperatures, I'm sorry, collect oxygen temperature profiles from each of the three bays monthly, beginning after ice out. And as you know from last week, I define ice out as ice melted for the summertime. So the end of the winter ice and, and water in the summer uh, is ice out. Uh, you might get ice melt and then freeze again. That's probably not ice out. Ice out is when the ice is gone. And uh, oh, so I'll repeat this. Collect oxygen temperature profiles from each of the three bays monthly beginning after ice out and progressing. Until the lake is isothermal. And I've defined that as it did last week. Isothermal means occurring at a constant temperature in the fall. So again, back to this without the definition, until the lake is isothermal in the fall. The next recommendation is water quality data should be collected in the spring to assess the effects of shoreline erosion of exposed sediments on the lake while those effects are still measurable. The next recommendation is water quality data needs to be collected from the deep water during the summer anoxic period. Now I've defined anoxic here for anoxic here for people who aren't aware of these terms. Anoxic is a mental and physical disturbance that occur as a result of an abnormally low amount of oxygen in the body. Last week I said the body was probably plant in this leg, but it's also probably the vertebrates and invertebrates and other things like that. So uh, whatever is in there that's alive um, and needs oxygen uh, could be affected. So back to it again, I'll reword it without the definition. Water quality data needs to be collected from the deep water during the summer anoxic, anoxic period to assess the magnitude of internal loading occurrence of any diffusion into upper waters. So that's kind of what I'm going to read from the report. Uh, again, I do recommend to you that you, if you are interested in this, especially if you have a wall uh, that's larger than three feet or piers in the water or uh, the footing of your house is in the water that's left over. We don't do that anymore. I don't think they allow that anymore, but from the old days, way, way back, people do have their foundations in the water and uh, or you have beaches on your property, uh, that kind of thing, you, then you should probably go down and get a copy of this report. I'll let you borrow mine if you don't want to pay the uh, $16. But uh, and you'll, you'll see plenty of good information in here of all a lot of studies that have been done in the past and information that the town has collected, um, various maps, various uh, um, all kinds of data about the lake that uh, that Dr. Klein used to uh, to study this. So um, I think you'll find it very interesting. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some of my comments based upon this report. Um, I'm I'm a mathematician by uh, degree, and I'm a systems analyst by uh, one of the many things I did, but a uh, uh, systems analyst by training and by uh, profession. And I have views on these things because I've been uh, heavily involved in this kind of thing in the past as the manufacturer of sensors and things. And uh, so I, I have some comments here that uh, I, I basically like scientific approaches to things. And uh, I like things to see things done the right way. And I don't think there's any argument here. And I have mentioned to some of the people at the lake that are in, 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 in the middle of all this stuff over the years that I think that's the most important thing they should be doing on the lake now is measuring in a professional way every year over time the water quality in the lake and that other issues may take maybe secondarily uh, secondary in a point in a, in a in a priority to that and uh, I personally would like to see as much money spent by the lake association by the people on the lake by the town by the state um, wherever we can get the money from to do proper measurement 
and to uh, do it in a professional manager and get the statistics necessary to come up with a responsible plan for the future of the lake. And the future may be just a year away or two years away or 30 years away. But uh, there need, that, that, that is the most important thing that I think needs to be done up there. Gather the data, get the professionals like Dr. Knockline in there permanently and find out uh, uh, what's really happening, not only in the uh, lake but in the watershed area. Stop a lot of the, uh, what I call folklore that goes around. Uh, make uh, prioritize the actual problems and uh, try to get them in a, in a row. Now, the couple of meetings back when I talked about this at the uh, at the uh, uh, Highland Lake Special Number One, I did tell you that all these coves are filling up with silt. One of the worst, of course, is the Sucker Brick uh, Cove. Uh, we've got things coming in there since the flood. The Army Corps of Engineers got there in there and they did something and that needs to be fixed, but it's going to cost quite a bit of money. The cove itself is filling up and uh, the same with other coves around the lake. And there are things happening in that lake that need, that need attention and they need attention, at least a plan of what's going to be done uh, in the future and how it's going to be financed. The most important thing in all this is the financing of these plans. Financing of getting the information and people do their best with what they financing they have available and they have all kinds of ways to try to raise small amounts of money to study the water and a lot of them donate their own time and probably even buy some of the equipment necessary but um, I think uh, the people that uh, are at the lake that are involved in this do want to see it done properly and do want to get the money to be able to do that so I'm going to put up now some of my comments having read this report and I will change my mind when I see more information in writing in a form of a report from Dr. Knockline or from some other uh, scientist uh, uh, in this field. Number one, leave the drawdowns as is for the next five years or so so people can plan and execute expensive, very expensive structure, construction, maintenance and repair. It's very difficult to do any wa uh, work in the water at Highland Lake. First of all, you're depending upon the thing, uh, the water, the deep drawdowns, if you're in a deep uh, area of the lake. Uh, if you're in a shallow area, then you might be able to do it any year. But uh, if you're in a deep area where, where your walls are five to six feet, the structures are five to six feet, you have to wait for the deep drawdown. And uh, as I said earlier, that takes half the winter just to come down to the depth. And often doesn't even make it to the depth. Usually it does. But uh, uh, and there are people always pushing to try to keep it at six feet rather than eight feet. And um, it's hard to do the work. It's expensive. Walls are very expensive now. It's hard in the middle of the winter to get masons to work. If you only have one drawdown every three or four years, then you're, you're contesting for masons, and if you miss that period, you got to wait another three or four years to be able to continue. So it's not really, uh, it's something that's very serious and has to be taken very seriously. Second of all, carry out Dr. Knockline's recommendations, Ryan's view here, evaluating data as it becomes available. So if we say we're going to keep the drawdowns for the next five years in the same patterns they have been for the last five years, then people can plan. We can study in the meantime all, the doc, all Dr. Knockline's recommendations. We can gather a lot of scientific data, providing we have the money to be able to do so, which I'll talk about a little later. And um, we can do what I would call a more scientific, responsible plan, where we're planning for success, which is the name of this program. We're planning in advance. We're not running a couple weeks, a couple months before the drawdown to try to put a plan together and get it by the selectmen and all that. So I think uh, that now um, that's the, the very important from my particular viewpoint and from a lot of people that I talked to on the lake about this report already from their viewpoint. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Now there are a couple very knowledgeable pe people. Uh, I think there's uh, three people that are very knowledgeable on this uh, Board of Selectmen that do know the lake very well, maybe four. Matter of fact, there are four, I think. And uh, they know all about all this stuff, so I'm sure they'll come to what I would call a professional conclusion. The next thing is determine who is going to pay for the extensive professional scientific study 
and remediation implied over the years. Now, when we go to implement Dr. Nachlein's uh, recommendations when we go do the studies and I don't know it doesn't say in this report how long it takes to do any of these studies I assume they're not usually when you do studies of a lake uh, in a watershed they don't happen overnight you need years worth of data years white -E ears worth of data so you can compare things at different different depths and at different uh, and climatic situations and all over the years and uh, the last one, I think it was in 1980, that was done by the DEP, and it's referenced in this document, took about five years to do, and at that time, 1980, cost about $25,000. Then, once you do all the studies, then you have to evaluate and say, now what do we need to do? Maybe we got to get some money together for the Army Corps so we can stop the stuff coming in from Sucker Brook. Maybe we have to do some dredging here and there. Now, there's, uh, there's some tough, difficult, expensive decisions that need to be made. So uh, the, I think I would say nobody would probably disagree with scientifically studying the lake as a number one priority. Um, I don't think you're going to get too many people who say, no, we, don't, we shouldn't do that. The big question is going to be, how do we pay for it? And how do we have a plan so we know how much it's going to cost and over how many years? Uh, which are going to cost this year, next year, the following year, and then once we start to find the problems, what kind of money are we looking at to dredge, what kind of money are we looking at to fix the, the Army Corps of Engineers, help them with Suckerbrook Cove, or do we just say, okay, let's leave it all in the hands of the state. The state owns the lake, and maybe they do or don't own the lake, but how much can the state do for us? How much can the town do for us? How much can the lake group do, the lake people do for themselves? So um, that's... Uh, to me, uh, the most probably important thing that the attention is going to be brought on. And um, so I want to repeat this because I got one more uh, paragraph on it. Determine who's going to pay for the extensive professional scientific study and, re and, and uh, remediation implied over the years and any future work that may surface as a result of the implementation of Dr. Knockline's recommendations. Right? So. I think that's very important. I think that uh, uh, there is a way that we can obtain some money and uh, uh, to help here, and that is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction to the program tonight, and uh, well, the credits were up there, is that we have two real good possibilities to add new taxpayers to the town of Winchester. And when I wrote my green papers, I said, if you do get a real uh, substantial increase in the amount of taxes coming into this town each year from these developments, then maybe you can give a little of it to the lake to address these kind of problems and also give some to the town to address their problems and give some to the schools to help address their problems. So this is the lake piece I'm doing here tonight. So what I want to say is that I think that the lake people should try to understand better the developments that are coming in, uh, may or may not come into town. Try to help be more proactive in getting them here, not only just getting them the permits and the, and the permission to get their water and sewer up to the properties uh, on the corridor, up in the, uh, up in the hills of the corridor between Winston and Torrington, the Enterprise Corridor, but also um, afterwards, we have to be very friendly and have a, a symbiotic relationship with the developers to make sure that they, they're successful and that people, the houses, uh, condos get built, the golf course gets built, all the amenities get built, the water and sewer gets run down there properly, and that uh, they sell these units and that we, the whole town, prosper from this. So uh, I think right now, for the next few years, as I always say on this program, and time will bear it out, um, we have tough budgets every year, very tough budgets. And it's very easy to make statements like, well, the lake pays uh, 500 million of our taxes. Now, I want to point out to people, because I do get a lot, asked a lot of these questions uh, by people who aren't really familiar with how this, how this uh, revaluation works, and they hear a lot of propaganda from people about it, but when there's a revaluation like there was this year, the town doesn't get an extra penny from the revaluation. Doesn't get an extra penny. 
What happens is some people, like on the lake or in the town of Winchester, pay a lot more for their taxes because the value of their property has gone up. And you're taxed on the value of your property. Other people don't pay as much. So in effect, they get a break on their taxes because their property hasn't gone up as much. But the town still receives the same amount of money. So if we say, well, our revaluation has gone up this year at the lake or in Winchester, a huge amount, doesn't mean that the town can then give you more money to fix your problems because they don't have any more money. Right? The only way they're going to get any more money is to increase the uh, addition, add, add additional taxpayers to the town. Either get in big developments like they're looking at now and trying to handle or get in more manufacturing facilities that provide jobs and pay taxes. As you know, Halmet is the largest taxpayer, the last I knew, in, the, in this town. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, factories in the uh, area pay pretty hefty taxes to us, as well as provide jobs and give away money uh, to charitable causes and things. So they're very good. Um, the other, of course, is to get more retailers into town and to uh, get new homeowners to come to town. And that gets a little complex, as we always talk about on this program. I'm speaking mainly to Highland Lake people who aren't here in the winter and they probably haven't heard this program before. But that gets complex because we have problems with the, the, the grades in the schools. And if you're not having good test scores, uh, and there are reasons why they don't have good test scores that need to be addressed, and they're probably addressing those. But um, uh, if we don't have good test scores, then it's hard to get manufacturing people to come to town. Because one of the things that everybody wants to know if they have a good skill and if they're educated and they have other opportunities elsewhere, they want to know are the, what are the schools like. First question I was told by a uh, former head of the EDC, Economic Development Commission, that's the first question people ask. What's the quality of the schools in this area? And uh, that's very, very important. So this is a very, very complex situation. So what I want to say is anybody uh, who is confused about any of this. There's all kinds of information in the city hall, either in inland wetlands or planning and zoning, about uh, what's going to happen here. Uh, it was pretty obvious when we did all the studies and listened to the expert testimony that the developments are not going to hurt the lake, they're not going to hurt the wells around the lake, they're not going to hurt the Canavo Spring, and there, all that went through with scientists talking to scientists. Mr. Knockline was even involved in some of those discussions. Uh, these uh, these people at the lake uh, or in the developments, uh, they want to see everything go smoothly too. They provided a budget for the town to look over their shoulder during the whole process and make sure they do things. Dr. Knockline, I'm pretty sure uh, he helped in setting up some test points around the property so that we can find out, uh, you know, do monitoring uh, in the watershed area or, or near these properties to make sure they're not damaging and. Uh, and that the actual facts aren't any different than the assumptions we made when we approved these properties. So there's quite a bit of uh, knowledge there that's uh, in the town hall and documents and you can find out for yourself. And then what I would say is find out what uh, all these things are and then be positive. Try to get help us get more additional uh, taxpayer revenue in town, which these businessmen that we have as selectmen are trying to do right now. So if we get money in the town, then we can parcel it out to the lake, we can parcel it out to the schools, we can parcel it out to the town, and we can uh, be, uh, be, be uh, very much more economically responsive to these problems, and that will help everybody out. It'll make it a lot easier for the people who want to study the lake properly. It'll make it a lot easier for the people who want to do different things down in our town. Uh, it'll make it easier to, to get a better education and perhaps the test scores up, although that's a complex issue that I'm not an expert on. But um, it'll help the people who, who are uh, who uh, are re been very reluctant over the years to pay more than an average of 4% taxes in Winstead. That's what it's averaged over the last 10 years. This year now, we haven't got it approved yet, but we're sitting at about 3%. So now, uh, there are other things happening, too, at the lake, and uh, I'm not going to go into them tonight, but there was an article in the paper about uh, about some of the problems, uh, some as a result of this study, others. There, there are some pet projects at the lake that they want to do that have been recommended in the past, like perhaps monitor fertilizer utilization, not cutting as many trees down, a lot of things like that. 
and there's always two sides to each of those arguments, and uh, and uh, it brings out uh, all kinds of experts and all kinds of expertise, and it brings out a lot of folklore, and it brings out a lot of facts and truth. So it's a very complex issue. So I'm taking this hour tonight uh, uh, to catch everybody before they go home for Labor Day, back to their homes, and to let you know. And if you want to follow any of this in the future, uh, you will get, I'm sure, the Lake, the Lake Group sends out a paper and other people send out papers. But if you need any more information, just contact the Inland Wetlands Office in the Town Hall or the Planning and Zoning Office. And, uh, and if you think you need extra help, then get a hold of me and I'll be willing to help you pull some information together. But I think the most important thing here is that everybody gets what I call the absolute value, that's a mathematical term, the absolute value of the information. And uh, if you get three different uh, experts in the room, you know, uh, to talk to you about the same subject, you get three different opinions. They will overlap and they'll agree on a lot of things. But uh, I hear a lot of, you know, if I ask one, I get an answer. I ask another, I get the opposite answer or I get some answer somewhere in between. So it's very, very difficult to come, for even experts to agree. And for amateurs, um, uh, educators, and, and people like that to understand it all, it's very, very difficult. So that was the program for tonight. I'm happy to see it. I'd like to see people show up to vote on the sales of the property on Monday, at, uh, just before the selectmen meeting. And uh, make sure you show up on the 6th of September to vote for the budget. Um, uh, uh, I don't know how the budget's going to go, but I know that if it gets cut, we're going to be even more uh, uh, relying on these developments and other additional revenue taxpayers coming into town. And I don't see any real hope of getting too much of that for the next four or five years. So we're going to be stra tightly strapped here. And everybody, when they come and ask for money, like $15,000, which it says in this article, which may or may not be true, but that's what it says in the article, then they all should say, here's how I think you can get the $15,000. And they should have some uh, some uh, ways that they think the 15,000 because that 15,000 plus 15,000 for the diquat plus 15,000 more for this and 15 more for the schools and some money for this that all adds up with that I want to say thank you very much have a good evening Be back next week